Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 320, Thoughts on My Debate with Rogers About Mark, Part 2, Interpretive Fails. In this episode, the last of my reflections on my recent debate. And the general theme here is that Anthony Rogers, like a number of Jesus is God apologists, reflects what is, at best, poor judgment about scriptural scholarship. The key to his success is his crowd-pleasing aggression combined with his ability to come off in the eyes of an ordinary person like a scholar. But as I'll explain in this episode, he does a lot of things that good scholars don't do. One of those things is cherry-picking among the various scholars based on a preconceived idea that one is trying to support. Now about the fulfillment fallacy, my point in the debate and in some blog posts that I've made through the years is that when an Old Testament text is said to be fulfilled in a New Testament passage, you can't infer that the fulfiller is the same one that the text was originally about. Because in fact, in many cases, there are clearly two meanings and two different reference, two different beings or groups of beings that are being referred to. And this is a common point of view that most contemporary scholars take, whether they be conservative, mainline, or liberal. This is where Rogers just ridiculously denies that there are any such multiple meanings. Now, the way I'm going to show how fringe this view of his is, is I'm going to look up some passages in the excellent NET Bible. This is a recent study Bible with big, long, heavy notes that focus a lot on translation and textual issues, more so than purely just interpretive issues, but it also covers those. This is a product completely of conservative evangelical scholarship. So we're not talking Unitarians here. We're not talking, quote, liberals, whatever those are. We're talking about seminary professors from Dallas Theological Seminary or Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, places like that. One of the very examples I gave in the debate is Matthew chapter 1, where he writes, Look, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel which means God with us. And I said, back in Isaiah 7, that was about some youngster that was to be born around that time. And yet here is Matthew saying that it's fulfilled in Jesus. So I guess when the prophet spoke it, he had one meaning in mind, but God, the ultimate author of scripture, must have also had this other application, this other meaning in mind. You shouldn't infer from this that Jesus is the same person as that baby back in Isaiah's time. So it's just a very nice way to explain what the fulfillment fallacy is. Roger's response, no way, that was just about the Messiah all along. It wasn't ever about anybody else. Totally ridiculous. First, let's look at what the scholars say, and then we'll look at the actual context in Isaiah 7. About Matthew one twenty three, the NET scholars write this, in part, In the original context, this passage pointed to a child who would be born during the time of Ahaz as proof that the military alliance of Syria and Israel against Judah would fail. Within Isaiah's subsequent prophecies, this promise was ultimately applied to the future Davidic king, who would one day rule over the nation. Right, there's your two meanings right there. Okay, but you don't even need a study Bible to see this. You can just look at Isaiah 7, and the header put there by the translator says, Ahaz receives a sign. What is this sign? Go to verse 10. Yahweh again spoke to Ahaz, Ask for a confirming sign from Yahweh your God. You can even ask for something miraculous. But Ahaz responded, I don't want to ask. I don't want to put Yahweh to a test. So Isaiah replied, Pay attention, family of David. Do you consider it too insignificant to try the patience of men? Is that why you are also trying the patience of my God? For this reason, the Lord himself will give you a confirming sign. Who's the you there? Ahaz. Look, 
This young woman is about to conceive and will give birth to a son. You, young woman, will name him Emmanuel. Now, how do we know this is a child back in the time of Isaiah and not originally Jesus? Well, because it's spoken to this ancient king. Verse 16, Before the child knows how to reject evil and choose what is right, the land whose two kings you fear will be desolate. Yahweh will bring on you, your people, and your father's family, a time unlike any since Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. So it's part of the prophecy that before the child has come of age where they can know right and wrong. What is that? Five, eight, ten, twelve, whatever. The point is it's not very far into the future. Then certain things are going to happen. Now this is just a rock-solid example of a passage which, according to the New Testament, has to do with Jesus, and yet clearly, originally, it had to do with someone else. Can you find any scholars who deny that? Well, you know, sadly you can. Some of them have this assumption that, well, it just won't count as a good prophecy or won't be convincing enough or something. For some reason, God wouldn't use texts that have double meanings. I'm not exactly sure why they assume that. Uh, And so, look, if the New Testament says it's about Jesus, it's just about Jesus, and that's all there is to it, right? And just ignore all the information that we just looked at, that any reader can see for himself. See, it's fair to summarize the state of affairs as, this is what scholars say, except for, you know, a few wingnut cases. Another example which I gave and which came up in the debate is Psalm 110, Here's what the NET scholars write in introducing this psalm. In this royal psalm, the psalmist announces God's oracle to the Davidic king. And then about the phrase, my Lord, in the first verse, they write, in the psalm's original context, the speaker is an unidentified prophetic voice in the royal court, likely addressing David, the head of the dynasty, In the course of time, the psalm is applied to each successive king in the dynasty and is likely understood as such by David. See 2 Samuel 7, 11-14 and 19. Skipping a bit, ultimately these words come to apply to the ideal Davidic king, specifically Jesus Christ, the son of David. Right. Two contexts, two meanings, two reference. Originally, this is about a king being coronated, whether David or somebody else. But in the New Testament, authors repeatedly say that this is fulfilled in Jesus. And by the way, this went by fast in the debate, but Rogers patently misunderstands and misreads what's happening in this psalm. In a way, again, motivated by his confusion of Jesus with God. It starts by saying, Here is Yahweh's proclamation to my Lord. Sit down at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Right, and the New Testament repeatedly says this is fulfilled in the exaltation of Jesus as portrayed in Revelation 5. So the mental picture here is you've got God on a throne and then sitting at his right hand, right at the highest position of power next to or under God, there's God's human king. So the one at the right hand here addressed as my Lord is the human king. And in the New Testament, this is Jesus, his human Messiah. The part that Rogers is confused about is verse 5. As the psalmist continues, it says, O Lord, at your right hand, he, and that's referring to Yahweh, he strikes down kings in the day he unleashes his anger. Okay, so Rogers and other confused Jesus as God people say, who's the one at the right hand? Well, we know that's the Messiah, right? Right. Yeah, so far, so good. Now, here it's being said that the one at the right hand is Yahweh. Okay, so the one at the right hand in verse 1, that's also God himself. You got God himself on the throne, but also you have God himself next to God. Complete nonsense, but more to the point, it's just misreading what's happening here. There are two different right hand kind of idioms in the Old Testament. One is this idea of being seated at the right hand of God, which is to be elevated to a high position under God. But there's another right-hand idiom that's far more common, 
And your right hand represents your ability, your power. And so for God to watch over your right hand and be at your right hand is for God to be backing you up in what you're doing. So basically, for Yahweh to be at your right hand is for him to give you victory and make you effective in your action. So there is no confusion here between God and God's king. Nor is there any confusion in the New Testament between God and God's Christ. Now, (laughs) this is more than can be said about many contemporary interpreters, and yes, some scholars. So for a good example of this, there's a unique and helpful and interesting commentary co-edited by J.K. Beale and D.A. Carson called Commentary on the New Testament Use of the Old Testament. And it just goes through the New Testament and comments on every quotation, basically every reference to an Old Testament text, and kind of ask, well, what are they doing? So they're wrestling with this issue that can be perplexing to many modern readers. And one way to put it is the problem is that New Testament authors don't seem to be using historical critical exegesis in how they make use of Old Testament texts. So as we just heard, a study Bible made by all conservative evangelical scholars looks at a psalm like Psalm 110 and says, hey, in the context of ancient Judaism, This psalm makes sense as a royal coronation psalm. There's no need to deny that just because the New Testament teaches that it's about the Lord Jesus and his exaltation to God's right hand. That's right. But one thing you see throughout this commentary, and I see it like a drumbeat over and over, is a misplaced polemic against Jesus being a, quote, mere man. The authors think that they need to rescue Jesus from any reader thinking that he is human and not also divine. He doesn't have a divine nature in some sense. So surely he must have a divine nature. He's just too amazing to be only human and not also divine. And this results in a lot of special pleading of the form over and over. Surely this can't be a mere man, you know, as if this were some sort of insight. The assumption is that Jesus just won't be important somehow unless he has a divine nature. And this is a common assumption in small-c Catholic traditions. It goes back to the late 100s. It's an assumption rejected by most Unitarian Christians because there are no good reasons for it. You can't come up with a good argument for this using either scripture or human reason or a combination thereof. So in this commentary, overall, it's a very nice and helpful piece of scholarship. In many cases, they agree with me and you know, probably most of the relevant scholars that clearly there have to be two meanings for this text, one relating to the more ancient time and one relating to the New Testament era. On the other hand, and this is where their assumption comes in, sometimes they want to say that a text like Psalm 110 is only about Jesus. Because what it says about this Lord is just too high, too exalted to be about any, quote, mere man. How could this be said about any ancient king? They quote a scholar saying that, hey, this is an enthronement oracle, right? So it's a prophecy spoken at the enthronement of a king. But then they add, no king of Israel was ever so close to God that he could normally be described even metaphorically as sitting at God's right hand. Well... That's quite an extraordinary thing to say, because this very passage is an example of that. This is just pure special pleading based on the unexamined assumption that, you know, a mere man could not be exalted to God's right hand. Right? Go back to the NET scholars. To sit at the right hand of the king was an honor. The Lord's invitation to the Davidic king to sit down at his right hand reflects the king's position as the Lord's vice-regent, in other words, ruling under him. So they don't see any problem with the Davidic king being described as being at the right hand of God. This is God's people. God is allowing this man to be in charge of God's people, under God, of course. Well, that's what it means to be placed at the right hand of God. It doesn't imply or assume that you are God that you're divine, that you're not a mere man, etc. Going back now to the commentary on the New Testament use of the Old Testament, they continue, The triumph over the king's enemies as he is arrayed in holy majesty, Psalm 110, verses 2 and 3, can possibly be taken of an earthly Davidic king, 
possibly. But 110 verse 4 returns to language that seems highly inappropriate even for one as exalted as David. What? What does that verse say? In the NET translation, it says, The Lord, in other words, Yahweh, makes this promise on oath and will not revoke it. Quote, you are an eternal priest after the pattern of Melchizedek. End quote. Right, so eternal would seem to just mean permanent. Would that seem especially appropriate to our everlasting high priest that we now have in Jesus? Absolutely. Is this the thing that would never be appropriate to say to an ancient king? That's not clear. And so they don't really seem to have much of an argument there. They also go on snatching defeat from the jaws of victory to make Roger's mistake. They write, and in Psalm 110 verse 5, Yahweh is said to be at this king's right hand rather than vice versa, as if God and the king were interchangeable. (sighs) Now back to the argument in our debate. Rogers thought it was very important here that Jesus refers to David as the author. And there is in the manuscripts a traditional ascription of this psalm to David. Did David write this psalm? Maybe. I mean, it doesn't really matter to the points I'm making. Some scholars think the thing to do here is to go with Jesus, but others would say, hey, he's just referring here to the traditional authorship, and he's not making the point that, hey, this really was David. You know, like when you're talking about the writings of Moses, and you read the bit at the end of Deuteronomy where it's talking about what happens after Moses' death. Well, that wasn't written by Moses, but still in conversation, one might say, well, Moses wrote, you know, and be citing part of that passage. Okay, so Jesus says David, whether or not that's the actual author, whoever the human author is, is referring to the Messiah here, right? But using this text as messianic does not imply or assume that the text had no different earlier meaning. It's just not necessary to say that about the Psalms and the other prophetic texts in the Old Testament that are fulfilled in Jesus. And of course, Jesus does teach that the Psalms make predictions about him. Whether or not they were understood at the time to be predictions is really neither here nor there. Now, what were the Jews doing with the Psalms all those years before the coming of the Messiah? If you think about it, most of these texts don't have a big label on them that say, hey guys, this is a prediction about the Messiah. It's not going to have anything to do with you until some future time. Maybe there are some texts like that, but... On the face of it, at least most of them had some earlier application. So they were using the Psalms in this songbook, basically, for some traditional or ceremonial purposes. Now, is this weird? Is it arbitrary to talk about two meanings, two different sets of things that are being referred to? Not really. Just think about the general concept of Scripture as being inspired. That means that humans really did compose these books. And yet, divine providence was at work. So, in a sense, God is composing as well. The human author can have one thing in mind, and the divine author might also have something else in mind. So, it's weird. It's unusual, maybe. But this idea of multiple meanings isn't really that difficult in itself, given that you believe in divine inspiration. That it's God himself who has overseen the writings of these books and can, in a sense, be thought of as their author, even while allowing that they were really composed by the human authors. When the Trinity's podcast returns, interpreting some other famous psalms and misinterpreting passages about Jesus' limited knowledge. Another text that came up is Psalm 45, part of which is applied to Jesus in Hebrews 1. 
Here's what the NET scholars say about Psalm 45. This is a romantic poem celebrating the Davidic king's marriage to a lovely princess. The psalmist praises the king for his military prowess and commitment to justice, urges the bride to be loyal to the king, and anticipates that the marriage will be blessed with royal offspring. Right, But whoever's getting married here, this is not the same guy as Jesus. You can't conclude that from the fact that Jesus fulfills a portion of this according to Hebrews 1. Another text quoted in the New Testament, Psalm 2, the NET scholars say about this, In this royal psalm, the author asserts the special status of the divinely chosen Davidic king and warns the nations and their rulers to submit to the authority of God and his chosen vice-regent. In other words, the human king. Now, a really in-your-face, kind of brutal example of how the Old Testament meaning and context and referent is one thing, and the New Testament context meaning and referent is another thing, is one that I was reminded of in a discussion by I guess you'd call him a liberal evangelical Bible scholar, Dr. Pete Enns. And this is Matthew 2.15, which is talking about after Mary and Joseph and the young Jesus fled to Egypt, they eventually come back. Matthew writes, He stayed there until Herod died. In this way, what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet was fulfilled. I called my son out of Egypt. Okay, so there's a clear claim of fulfillment there. And the quotation is from Hosea 11.1. And this is what that says. When Israel was a young man, I loved him like a son. I summoned my son out of Egypt. Okay, so who is the son here in the original context? It's the nation of Israel, like when they were in bondage before the Exodus. Notice it's not even a prediction. It's just impossible to say, hey, well, really this was only about Jesus all along. No, just obviously wrong. It's referring to the past. But according to Matthew, there was an extra layer of meaning intended by God. And by the way, the commentary on the New Testament use of the Old Testament gets this exactly right. They say, Hosea 11.1 is a reference to the Exodus, pure and simple. And so they go on to explain that the son there is Israel. And about what Matthew is doing with it, they plausibly explain it as what they call a classic example of pure typology or correspondence in history. The author thinks that there's a kind of historical foreshadowing here, basically. Is that what Hosea had in mind? Absolutely not. Is that how people read it before the time of Jesus? As far as we can tell, no. If you want to read some more on this matter of New Testament use of Old Testament texts, I recommend a short book called Three Views on the New Testament Use of the Old Testament, co-authored by Walter Kaiser, Daryl Bach, and Peter Enns. But yeah, you don't have to look in a book like that. You can just look in the notes of any study Bible when they talk about the two contexts of the two different meanings and the two different reference. So, going back to Mark 1, all of this is why, even though, yes, makes straight the paths of Yahweh in the original text, that was about Yahweh, But even though Jesus is fulfilling that, it's not the author's way of saying that Jesus just is Yahweh himself. That's a beginner's mistake of interpretation, and I've named it the fulfillment fallacy. And that it's a fallacy is acknowledged by almost all current Bible scholars and educated Bible readers. And you should be seeing a pattern here. The confusion together of Jesus and God is all important, And everything has to bow in submission to that. And it doesn't matter what the facts are. And to be perfectly clear, again, yes, you can find a few scholars who insist that any text fulfilled by Jesus was always and only about him. But, you know, sad to say, given human nature, sometimes scholars are just in denial about clear facts. And it speaks very poorly of Mr. Rogers' judgment that he sides with them. Now, in the course of the debate, I say one way this author signals that Jesus is not God himself is that Jesus, as portrayed in the gospel according to Mark, is not omniscient, whereas we should think that God is essentially omniscient. So, all-knowing, but he couldn't fail to be all-knowing. He's that way essentially. So, one of the texts I pointed out was this, Mark 13, 32. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. 
And Rogers spun out this long yarn about, okay, the context has to do with a wedding. In a Jewish wedding, only one of the fathers involved had a right to announce the day and hour of the wedding. The groom didn't have the right to do that. I don't know if this is true, by the way, but this is what he said. And in one place, Paul says, you know, I only knew Christ among you. So when you say you only knew something, you might mean that that's the only thing that you talked about, or that's the only thing that you announced, or maybe it's the only thing you have authority to announce. And so all that Jesus is saying here is that the Father has the right, the authorization to pronounce or to share, to communicate the day or the hour, but the Son doesn't, nor does anybody else. So it's not really about ignorance at all. It's just about this right to announce certain truths. I had encountered this before in Augustine and others, and I just, it's just obviously wrong. What I wish I had said in the debate was this, read the next verse, keep reading the passage, because the rest of the passage tells you that it's precisely knowledge that is in view here and not the right to announce or something like this. Let me read the whole thing for you, New Revised Standard Translation. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Lord, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when... The master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or at cock crow or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. So knowledge is precisely the issue. The application of the statement that no one knows the day or hour except the Father is that, guess what? You guys don't either. And he's not telling them that they don't have the authority to announce these truths. It's just nonsense. This is why if you pick up your study Bible or commentary, you won't find this deity of Christ saving misinterpretation being propounded. You could get away with it in patristic times. You can't get away with it anymore because the context makes very clear that it is knowledge which is the issue. Now, in the debate when I pointed out that this isn't the only place in Mark where Jesus is portrayed as not knowing thing, boom, out came another crazy grammatical argument. This is a classic example of somebody knowing just enough Greek to cause problems and thinking that too much depends on some fine point of grammar. So here's the episode in Mark 5. A woman with a long-standing bleeding issue comes up and touches Jesus. She feels, you know, the power and she realizes she's been healed. This is what Mark writes. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, "Who touched my clothes?" And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? Okay, does Jesus know who touched him? Of course he doesn't. That's why he's looking around saying, Who touched my clothes? He's not doing this for the disciples' benefit. What benefit would this be to them? Passage continues. He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Okay, so she has to fess up for him to know who did it, right? So he's not all-knowing. That's assumed in this passage. So he brings in this brilliant grammatical argument. Part of it has to do with the verb tense that he's looking around for a certain purpose, which is stated there, which is to see. And then the Greek says, Tain tuto poiesasan. So, tain is a female form of the in Greek. And presumably it's female because it matches the woman who was mentioned before. So, he's looking around to see, literally, the one having done this in Greek, tuto this, poiesasan, having done. And so, almost all translations communicate basically that Jesus is trying to find out who touched him. NIV, NLT, ESV, KJV, Holman Christian Standard Bible, they all translate something like, he's trying to see who had done this. Now, the hyperliteral NASB, the New American Standard Bible, says he looked around to see the woman who had done this. 
Right. He's trying to find out who touched him. The one who touched him was a woman. Roger seemed to think that because he's trying to find her, that therefore he knew all along that it was her. But what he knows about her is that she touched him, but he doesn't know which person this is. The whole incident makes that clear. All right, so it doesn't really matter whether you translate that he was looking for her or just as most translations go with uh, that he's looking to see who did this. It doesn't matter because even if you translate as he's looking to find her, that doesn't imply that he knew it was a her, much less that he knew it was this particular her. That's why he goes through this period of searching for her and she has to come and fess up to him before he can deal with her. To put it differently from the narrator's point of view, Jesus is looking for the woman, the one who the narrator knows has touched Jesus. But saying that he's looking for her does not imply or assume that Jesus knows who he's looking for, like who specifically, beyond just whoever it was that touched me. Now, interestingly, for whatever reason, when Matthew retells this story, he just leaves out the whole search for who touched him. I don't know, I guess he just wants a faster flowing story or something, or he doesn't want to emphasize Jesus' ignorance for some reason. But in Luke's retelling, it's very clear that Luke thinks that Jesus didn't know who touched him. And this same little grammatical feature that he's fastening on, of course, doesn't occur in Luke. In fact, it's possible that Luke looked at the grammatical construction that Rogers used to make his argument and decided not to reproduce it because a person might take it the wrong way, as if Jesus knew who he was looking for all along. And in fact, Luke also makes clear that this searching period went on for some time. Luke 8.45, then Jesus asked, who touched me? When all denied it, right? So he's looking around, was it you? No, was it you? No, not me. Was it you? No, not me. Finally, after all that, Peter said, master, the crowds surround you and press in on you, right? So why would you be asking that? Jesus said, someone touched me for I noticed that power had gone out from me. And then verse 47, when the woman saw that she could not remain hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. And he tells her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. So Matthew chooses to ignore Jesus's search for who touched him. Luke does include that as an element of the story. And Luke seemingly does not get this brilliant argument that Jesus must have known who it is all along because Mark used a female form of the when it says Jesus was looking for who or the one who did it. Again, it's a fringe view to try to preserve Jesus' omniscience. Even try to turn it around and say that, no, this shows he is omniscience because he knows exactly who touched him. No, he didn't. He's not faking it during this searching period. Come on, get real. And guys, even if Jesus knew all along exactly who touched him, like he knew it was that specific woman, that wouldn't imply that he's omniscient. Absurdly, Rogers at one point says this in the debate, that this actually proves Jesus' omniscience. Of course, it doesn't. If he has that special piece of knowledge, that would be consistent with his being omniscient, but it wouldn't logically imply his being omniscient. It might just be a case of supernatural prophetic knowledge. Jumping for omniscience based on that passage is just not sober reasoning. What it is, is trying to read your precious theory into a passage where it doesn't belong. When the Trinity's podcast returns... How Rogers, like many present-day apologists, misreads some of the early Christian theologians. Now, at one point in the debate, I pointed out that Anthony Rogers used a silly phrase from Richard Bauckham that Jesus has the divine identity, which is a very recent piece of language and a recent confusion. 
And because of this, and maybe because of other things I said I can't remember, he wanted to emphasize that his views were indeed ancient and traditional and not at all new. Whereas my views are totally new because, you know, nobody ever thought anything like Dale Tuggy until the 16th century. So he's thinking of non-Trinitarian Christians in the early Reformation era like the Socinians. He doesn't know the relevant church history here. In brief, Logos speculations were new with Justin Martyr, and they were very widely rejected, especially by non-scholars for the first, especially hundred years, uh, although you find people rejecting them even in the fourth century as well, like the Bishop Photinus. The people who rejected them were referred to especially by later historians, as monarchians, because they said, we uphold the monarchy of the one God, the Father Almighty. We don't believe in two gods like you believe in. And indeed, that is precisely what the Logos theorists believed in. They believed in the one true God. Oh, and also there's this second lesser God, that's the Logos. And they assume that the one true God is just too transcendent somehow to create directly. So he must have created through this lesser deity, which he somehow first emanates out of himself. Some of these monarchians, historians call modalistic monarchians, and these are basically the ones who, like Jesus as God apologists in the present day, just collapse Jesus and God together. Turns out the Father and the Son just are the same one. But those weren't all the monarchians. Right, the monarchians are basically rejectors of Logos theory. The other kind were what historians call dynamic monarchians. And those are basically what we now call biblical Unitarians. They think Jesus is God's human Messiah. And they did not think that the Logos, the word of John 1, is supposed to be the pre-human Jesus. They just thought it was God's word by which he created all things. So something like a divine action or a divine property like wisdom now, to try to prove that his views were ancient and mainstream, he quoted two early writers, Irenaeus from the late 100s and Novation from the mid-200s. And he gets their views wrong. This is typical for Jesus as God apologists. Because they never deeply engage with these sources. Rather, they just opportunistically mine them for places where Jesus is referred to as theos or deus. In other words, they're just looking for Jesus as God proof text, basically, in these fathers. They're not stopping to ask, if Jesus is referred to as God here, what did they mean by that? And it turns out in this period, they don't mean that he's the same God as the Father. These people are defenders of what was at the time rather new Logos speculations about God and the Son of God. And they're well aware that a lot of Christians reject these speculations. And so consequently, especially Origen and Novation, but also Tertullian, they take time to argue against both the modalistic monarchians and the dynamic monarchians. To give an example, in his book called Against Celsus, Origen, writing near the middle of the 200s, says this, and he's referring to this earlier pagan critic Celsus, but he's also referring here to the modalistic monarchians who confuse Jesus with God. And this quote is on a blog post from a couple years ago called Origin on the Challenge to Jesus as God Apologist. If you want to see this in written form, Origen writes, if the pagan critic Celsus misunderstood certain people who do not confess that the Son of God is the Son of him who created the universe, that is a matter between him and those who agree with this doctrine. We affirm that this person is Son of God, yes, of God, to whom, if we may follow Celsus' words, we pay very great reverence. And we know his Son, who has been greatly exalted by the Father. Here's the part where he's going to talk about the modalistic monarchians. But we grant that some of those among the multitude of believers take a divergent view, in other words, divergent of the view that Jesus is the Son of God, and because of their rashness, suppose that the Savior is the greatest and supreme God. But we at least do not take that view, since we believe him who said, the Father who sent me is greater than I. And that's precisely what Jesus as God apologists think, that Jesus is the greatest and supreme God. That was denounced as a confusion by Origen, by Tertullian, and by Novation. Now, when he goes to quote the Church Fathers to show that they agree with me, he blows it both times. Rogers argues, hey, Christians have always said that Jesus could only forgive sins because he's God himself. He is the one God. 
Nobody but the one God can forgive sins. And he appeals to Irenaeus against heresies, book 5. Here's the passage. It's on page 545 of the old Antinocene Fathers, volume 1, translation. Or it's book 5, chapter 27, sections 1, 2, and 3. So he starts off this chapter talking about the one God. Now this being is the creator who is, in respect of his love, the Father. But in respect of his power, he is Lord, and in respect of his wisdom, our maker and fashioner, by transgressing whose commandment we became his enemies. And therefore, in the last times, the Lord has restored us into friendship through his incarnation, having become the mediator between God and men, propitiating indeed for us the Father against whom we had sinned, and canceling our disobedience by his own obedience. And then he's basically making the point that the God who gave us the commandments is the same one that Jesus calls Father. That's good reading comprehension. That's who the Father is in the New Testament. He says, He's the God who was proclaimed in the Scriptures to whom we were debtors, having transgressed his commandment. Now, the commandment was given to man by the Word. For Adam, it said, heard the voice of the Lord God. Rightly then does his Word say to man, Thy sins are forgiven thee. He, the same against whom we had sinned in the beginning, grants forgiveness of sins in the end. Now, who is the he here? Is it God or is it the word of God? Well, if you just read that passage by itself, you'll think it's the word of God, but it's not. Rather than read the whole passage, let me just note that Irenaeus correctly picks up on the crowd reaction that I mentioned in the debate, where Matthew writes, after Jesus heals the guy, proving that he really does have authority on earth to forgive sins, Matthew writes, the people upon seeing it glorified God who gave such power unto men. And then he talks about, hey, this is the God of the Old Testament who had given this power to men. But getting to the main point in section three of this chapter, he writes, Therefore, by remitting sins, he did indeed heal man, while he also manifested himself who he was. For if no one can forgive sins but God alone, while the Lord remitted them and healed men, it is plain that he was himself the word of God made the Son of Man, receiving from the Father the power of remission of sins, since he was man and since he was God in order that since as man he suffered for us, so as God he might have compassion on us and forgive us our debts, in which we were made debtors to God our Creator. When he writes that he was man, you can translate that just as well as he was a man, and when he says he was God, you can just as well translate it as since he was a God. But Irenaeus doesn't think that the Father and Son are the same God. He thinks they're two different gods, a greater and a lesser. This is what all of the Logos theologians said. What makes Irenaeus tricky is that he avoids talk of two gods entirely because he knows it's controversial. One way you can see this is that as I pointed out in the debate, and as Rogers foolishly denied, when Irenaeus comes to the I don't know the day or the hour text, he just takes it at face value. This is what he says. Antinocene Fathers, Volume 1, page 401. Irenaeus against Heresies. Book 2, chapter 28, section 6. And he's talking about people who think that they can say things about the generation of the Logos from the Father. And he goes on this rant, section 6. But beyond reason, inflated with your own wisdom, you presumptuously maintain that you are acquainted with the unspeakable mysteries of God. While even the Lord, the very Son of God, allowed that the Father alone knows the very day and hour of judgment, when he plainly declares, But no man knows of that day and that hour, neither the Son, but the Father only. If then the Son was not ashamed to ascribe the knowledge of that day to the Father only, but declared what was true regarding the matter, Neither let us be ashamed to reserve for God those greater questions which may occur to us, for no man is superior to his master. If anyone therefore says to us, How then was the Son produced by the Father? We reply to him that no man understands that production or generation or calling or revelation or by whatever name one may describe his generation, which is in fact altogether indescribable. Yep, knowledge is precisely the point. And he doesn't feel any need to say, hey, actually in his divine nature, Jesus does know all. It's just that his human nature is limited to knowledge. 
He doesn't need to say that because he doesn't think they're the same God. He thinks the one true God is the Father. This is Yahweh in the Old Testament. He's all-knowing. He doesn't think that this God, this lesser second God, is all-knowing. And that's the same view you see in Novation's book, kind of mistitled on the Trinity. He actually doesn't use the word Trinity in the book. And by the way, he spends a lot of time bashing both kinds of monarchians that I discussed before. Sir Roger's gestures at chapter 13 of this book, section 6 of chapter 13, reads like this in the most recent translation. And I'll put a link to the book on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org. He writes, Now if Christ sees the secrets of the heart, Christ is certainly God, since God alone sees the secrets of the heart. If the same Christ forgives sins, Christ is certainly God, because no one can forgive sins but God alone. If Christ came down from heaven in coming into the world, Christ is certainly God, because no mere man can come from heaven, etc. Now, on the face of it, that's exactly what a Jesus is God apologist would want that to say. Hey, come on, Christ is God himself, and that's what explains why he can forgive and why he knows the secrets of the heart. Of course, right in the middle of the passage, you realize that the issue that he's really insisting on is that Christ has a divine nature, that he's not a mere man. And if you take the time to understand the entire book, you'll see that this is not a Trinitarian view, but rather a Unitarian subordinationist view of God and the Logos. You see this in chapter 31, where he finally deals with the arguments of the Monarchians who reject Logos theories. And basically, just to sum up, I should do an episode on Novation sometime because it's very interesting. He says that only the Father is divine in the highest sense of the word divine. Basically, it's the same view you see in all the other Logos theorists, that the Son is a second and lesser deity. Although he doesn't want to say it that way, because, like Irenaeus, he knows that would be controversial, particularly with ordinary Christians. Now, going back to chapter 13, there's a terrible translation problem with Latin theologies, And Latin is quite different than Greek. Greek has a bunch of different forms of the definite article, which in English is the. It can be singular or plural, it can be masculine, feminine, or neuter, and it can be in different cases. Never mind what cases are. The point is they have a whole bunch of different forms of the word that we would translate as the, and it comes in handy. One way it comes in handy is if you want to distinguish the God from a God. Sometimes it's important for that, not always. Latin has no definite article. So the way that you write God, capital G-O-D, and God, lowercase g-o-d, a God, and quote God are all the same. They didn't have quotation marks either. So if you say that Jesus is Deus in Latin, you could be identifying him as God himself, like those are one and the same. You could just be describing Jesus as divine, You could be saying that he is a God, or you could be saying that he's, quote, God. You'd say all of those the same way. And again, we know that Novation distinguishes the one God, the Father, who's fully divine, divine in the highest sense, from this Logos, who can be called God, but is not divine in the highest sense. And when you realize this, you realize he can't be saying that Jesus just is God, like the modalistic monarchians whose views he rejects. So let me read this passage again, interpreting his statements that Jesus is God in a different way. Now, if Christ sees the secrets of the heart, Christ is certainly a God, since a God alone knows the secrets of the heart. If the same Christ forgives sins, Christ is certainly a God, because no one can forgive sins but a God alone. If Christ came down from heaven and coming into the world, Christ is certainly a God, because no mere man can come from heaven. To continue, if the statement, I and the Father are one, can be said by no man, oops, and if Christ in the consciousness of his divinity makes this statement, Christ is certainly a God. If the Apostle Thomas, finally convinced by all the proofs and the facts of Christ's divinity, says in reply to Christ, my Lord and my God, Christ is certainly a God. If the Apostle Paul also writes in his epistles, of whom are the fathers and of whom is Christ, according to the flesh, who is over all things, a God blessed forever, Christ is certainly a God. If the same Apostle declares that he is an Apostle sent not for men by man, but by Jesus Christ, 
and asserts that he learned the gospel not from men or through man, but received it from Jesus Christ, Christ is certainly a God. A little farther on, all things are through him, and consequently he is a God. Now, I could go through that passage and read it again, and instead of saying a God, I could each time say a quote God, right, a so-called God, or maybe even a being with a divine nature. And it's not clear which of these would be the most accurate, or even if I should just use one of those throughout that whole passage. Nonetheless, while he doesn't think that Jesus is the one God, he's against the mere man people, and basically his point seems to be that Jesus is, quote, God or a God in the sense of having a divine nature and not just a human nature. The point is that when Novation calls Jesus God, it's unclear by his language quite what he means, but he can't just be collapsing Jesus with the one God because he thinks that's a monarchian mistake. Again, in chapter 31, he basically says, look, Jesus comes from God and is always subservient to God. If he had not been begotten, but had been without origin, that would be two gods. If he had been invisible and incomprehensible like the Father, that would count as two gods. But as a matter of fact, whatever he is, he is not of himself because he's not unborn, but is of the Father because he is begotten. He drew his origin in being born of him who is the one God. As a result, he could never constitute a second God because he did not constitute a second origin inasmuch as he received before all time the source of his birth from him who has no beginning. Skipping a bit. Therefore, he is God, quote, God, a God, but begotten precisely that he might be God, quote, God, a God. He is also Lord, but for this very reason, he was born of the Father that he might be Lord, his divinity is so presented to us that it may not appear, either through discordancy or through an inequality in the Godhead, the divine nature, that there he has produced two gods. For all things have been subjected to him as Son by the Father. The fact that he himself, together with all the things that are subject to him, is subject to his Father, proves that he is indeed the Son of his Father. However, he is considered the Lord and God of all else. Okay. So he can be called God. He's in some sense divine. He's not the one true God. The one true God is the Father. The Father is without origin. Jesus exists because of the Father. It's a subordinationist Unitarian view, just like you see in Tertullian and Origen. Once again, Rogers is simply misinterpreting an ancient source based on his all-consuming desire to show that Jesus is God. When push comes to shove, when Novation is really backed into a corner about why these aren't two gods, the Father and the Son, he doesn't say, well, I distinguish between being in person, my friend, and I think these are the same being but different persons. He doesn't say that. Nor does he employ any concept of a god as multipersonal. What he does, pressed with this kind of worry, is he says, well, strictly speaking, only the Father is a god. The Son is called a god, or, quote, god but really only the Father's God. That's the gist of his answer. At the end of chapter 30, he says, Let them acknowledge then by the same line of reasoning that the truth that there is one God is not prejudiced in any way by the other truth that Christ is also declared to be, I think we should add, quote, God. In other words, he's saying that by being called God, Jesus is not thereby taught to be a God. There's only one God, and that's the Father. And by the way, getting really familiar with the works of Novation, Origen, Tertullian, Justin Martyr, will help you eventually to see that there just wasn't current in those days an idea of God as multipersonal, or an idea of the Son as the same being as the Father, but a different person. If you're talking about Christian theologies, those really are 4th century ideas. Is there something kind of sort of similar going on in some earlier Jewish writings? It can be argued, but these guys, particularly Tertullian and Origen, but also Novation and Justin, they write enough to make their views clear, and you don't at any point in interpreting them need those later ideas. Right at the start of this debate, our host Marlon Wilson said something kind of revealing. In introducing Anthony, he said, Ah, this guy's a beast. He is a beast. He's a beast of a talker. He's not a beast of a scholar. 
He's quite mistaken about Mark. His theology is demonstrably confused in multiple ways. He's not clear about the actual views of Irenaeus or Novation. And in this discussion, we've seen the quality of his interpretations of things like the passage about the day and the hour, or about Jesus saying, who touched me? They're driven by this all-consuming desire to maintain, against the gospel according to Mark, that Jesus and God are one and the same. They're not. They're two different beings. One of them's a man. Jesus isn't God, but rather God's Son, and God's Christ, His Anointed One, His Messiah. Can you admit that and still be a Trinitarian? Yes. Can you admit that and in some sense believe in, quote, the deity of Christ? Yes. But try to develop your views in ways that make sense and that don't cut directly against the grain both of common sense and of the texts. In conclusion, the ordinary Christian needs to take care to separate bad scholars and pseudo-scholars from good scholars. And one thing that people who are not good scholars do is they, first of all, lord their knowledge of Greek or Hebrew over others. And they seem to presuppose very often, and this definitely applies to Rogers, that all or most of the major interpretive questions can be settled simply by looking at grammatical issues. You'll notice they break out big grammatical words, and they'll even say, hey, buddy, you don't know Greek, but I do. Real scholars won't do that. They won't try to pull rank and just disqualify and just bully the other person into agreeing with them based on that they know Greek. What they'll do is they'll carefully explain how the grammatical points are relevant. But if they're good scholars who really know how to make convincing arguments and to judge arguments fairly, they will usually go on to admit that the interpretive questions are not fully settled by just, you know, what kind of noun or verb is being used here. Interpretive matters are also going to require understanding the intellectual and historical context and understanding just the flow of thought and sometimes the flow of argument in a passage. I learned this as a graduate student studying scholarly debates about, you know, the proper interpretation of Aristotle or Thomas Aquinas. When you read scholarly literature like this, you realize that many or most of the participants in the scholarly debates actually have top-level Greek skills. And yet, here they are, having these arguments about what Aristotle or Plato or the Stoics really mean. In the debate, Rogers tried to taunt me that he knows Greek and I don't. Well, you know, I have beginner-level Greek. I've had that for a long time. I've never really been motivated to push it farther. And you'll notice I'm very careful how I use any kind of grammatical point in an argument. Because my view is that usually grammatical points don't settle interpretive debates. Right? Just think about who are the top level experts in Greek. Like not a guy like Rogers who has, you know, maybe some kind of intermediate level skill, but think about the real experts, okay? Well, you have among them people like Roman Catholics, you have Calvinists, you have a few Unitarians. Obviously, being a top level expert in Greek doesn't settle all the interpretive questions about the New Testament, which is why you have scholars with the various different theologies. The reason I haven't gone farther is I know enough Greek and Latin to understand some of the important translation issues and how those affect interpretation. I also understand enough to understand the points being made by high-level experts in those languages. Not necessarily the first time I hear them, but with some study, I can understand the points that they're making. I'm not willing to become a top-level expert in a language like Greek or Latin. And what I know, but I don't think Rogers knows, is that having just kind of intermediate level skills isn't a big help. And this tends to go hand in hand with the delusion that having intermediate Greek skills gives you the keys to kind of easily solve any interpretive issues and disputes. It doesn't. A great example of this is the very difficult passage that begins the gospel according to John. There are a few minor translation issues here, but there are at least three very different readings of that passage, and you just can't decide between the three based on issues of grammar. You can have scholars with any of those three opinions, and they'll just simply agree on the English translation. I'll put links to those many previous episodes of the Trinity's podcast 
on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org. So by all means, learn some Greek if you can. It's very useful to know a little bit. It takes talent and many years of hard work to become a real expert in Greek. And even then, again, it's not a magic key to solving disputes about interpretation. To have intermediate skills is definitely better than having beginning skills. It helps you to grasp more of the nuances of meaning, more of the translation issues. But if you're going to get those intermediate skills, use them with humility and don't delude yourself regarding how much these grammatical points actually show about what the passage really means. So again, the ordinary person needs to beware of somebody flaunting their supposed wonderful Greek skills, somebody lording it over people, and somebody who, when they say, hey, the grammar settles totally what this passage means, and you study it later, and you're like, oh, wait, no, it doesn't. Yep, that's a pattern and a habit with some people. And it's kind of a waste of time for the serious truth seeker. So, beware the fast-talking pseudo-scholar who likes to pop out grammatical big words and advertise what an expert in Greek he is, as if this makes him an expert in interpretation of the New Testament. Beware of somebody who comes at you with a hundred proof texts, but doesn't have the slightest concern about whether their interpretation is coherent. Not caring about logical consistency is not caring about the truth of the matter. Beware of the guy who hastily builds castles made of sand, which kind of just get immediately washed away as soon as the first wave of actual thinking comes in. This week's thinking music has been the track The Magic Bullet by Little Glass Men, also known as Ryan Klaus. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode at trinities.org where you can listen to or download that entire track. love the trinity's podcast please share this episode on social media like twitter or facebook and help other people to find the podcast by giving us an honest rating and review in the itunes store for your country you can also support the trinity's podcast by giving a certain donation per episode if you're interested in that please visit patreon.com slash trinities finally let us know what you think Give us a comment on the blog post for this episode or join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash trinities. The Trinities podcast is supported by and made for thinking believers like you. Thanks for your support, prayers, and encouragement. listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.